be here tonight. Uh, we just pray for the illumination of Scripture as we study your attributes and who you are. And Father, may we grow in our knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of who you are, recognizing who you are and who we're not, and that we are totally dependent upon you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The next set of where we will be going, and the one thing I want you to look at is the fact that at the last page, I did not write out all the verses for you. I just gave you the verses. Um, I had said that my goal, my desire was for the congregation to become like the Bereans. In order to become like the Bereans, you've got to look at the Scripture. So I left those blanks so you could look at the topics, go home and start looking through each and every one of those Scriptures because each and every one is going to re, uh, affirm and reiterate what you have been taught. And once you learn the scripture, you, once you learn the why, how everything is said, then you'll know the reason why you're doing what you're doing once you know the foundation. So that's why I didn't forget. I um, did that intentionally. So I wanted you to know that. Um, we are looking at the attributed perfections of God, his attributes. And... We started on the attributes, and the first one we began with last week was with wisdom. Yep. And today we're going to start on page 12. We're going to go back and look at his truth and faithfulness. Again, these are the perfect attributes of God. Now, we share these attributes. A lot of them we share, but ours have been tainted by our sin nature. We do not have the perfect aspect of what God does in regards to truth, wisdom. We have sin that is, uh, for, uh, for lack of terminology, retarded, brought our levels down a little bit where we don't have that same understanding. We have more of a finite grip. Well, you didn't get yours. I gave one, two. So we look at number two. Bruce, did you get another one? Bruce, can I get you to get another one? You give Miss Faye. That God's truth and faithfulness are the perfect correspondence of God's nature with what God should be, with the reliability of his words and deeds and with the accuracy of his knowledge, thoughts, and words. Now, you're also going to might, might see, for those of you, this is your first night, little blank spaces. I didn't forget. That's for you to write in the answer. That's for you to write in the answer. Now, the scriptural evidence we talked about, and I'm just kind of catching this up, for the truth and faithfulness is, A, he is the only real God. He is true in contrast to the false gods. And we hear, we look in these following verses and it will show both who God is and who the false gods are in their contrast. In Deuteronomy 32, 21, it says, they have made me jealous with what is not God. I want to stop right there. One of the names, and I've said it before, for God is Quana. He is a jealous God. That's Q-U-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, Quana. He is a jealous God. And he said he will not share his glory with anything. God's jealousy is perfect. It's based on his character and who he is. Our jealousies are, are picky and finicky over what we have, what we don't have, what we want, what we can't have, what somebody else has. You can see the contrast of that. God does not share his glory with anyone. Psalms 96.5, For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Idols, things that do not live, things that cannot live, things made by hand. But the Lord made the heavens. The Lord made the objects of which man carves out and, got, and they worship. 97, Psalms 97, 7. Let all those be ashamed who serve graven images, who boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all you gods. Again, he, he, he's a, that's a, a rebuke to us. 
We, are, we worship those people that don't worship God and worship idols. They worship things that were made by God. They take a tree and they carve it and they make it in an image and they worship it. But you know the validity of that. If they get cold, they take that same idol and they use it for wood, for fire. So it's not anything that can provide any kind of substance to them. God gets a little more specific in Psalm 115, 4 through 8. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. What does all of those things we just talked about provide an example of idols? What, what can we see in here that he just described about an idol? They don't have eyes. They can't see. They can't smell. They can't hear. What, what does that say? Yeah, it's not alive. We worship People that worship idols worship dead things. Dead things, not things that are alive. We worship the true and living God who created the material that man decides they want to make into an image so they can worship a dead thing. So that's what we covered. Now let's look at D, or let's look at B. It also says... That was A. B is, he. that's on page 14. God cannot lie or repent like a man. That's why he's trustworthy. He cannot lie or repent like a man that in, is in such a way that his word is untrue. And we see that in Numbers 23, 19, right off. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? 1 Samuel 15, 29, also the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that, should he, that he should change his mind. The fact that God cannot lie and repent like a man, that what he says is going to come true. How is that encouraging to us? If God cannot lie and he always does what he says, how, how is that encouraging to us? You can always depend upon him. That's right. What else do we know about that? Because God is good. Everything he says, what? It's true, but it's good. Good for who? Us. And if God says something is good for us and all things work through good, so if circumstances come our way that to us does not seem good, how is what we just read encouraging? Pardon? He's walking with you. But if it's good, what does that mean it's going to be for you? It's going to be great for us. Even if things on the outside do not look good, they do not look pleasing, but because God says it's going to happen, because God says all things work for good to those who love God and who are called according to God's purposes, then no matter what situation we're in, we can be encouraged that whatever it is, it will be good for us. We can remember Joseph when he talked to his brothers and his brothers were scared that Joseph was going to take revenge. Basically, he said, you meant evil for me, but God meant it for good. What does that require for us in our mindset to accept that? What are things we have to do to be able to accept that as good? We have to have faith. Okay, read the word. What is it that will hinder us from accepting this? Sin, what? Doubt. Pride. That is the big one. In modern Christianity, for most, and more in the name of claim it gospel, pride says you should not be afflicted with anything bad because God only wants you to be happy. 
God only wants you to be to experience good things. Your pride will refuse to accept what God is doing to you. So faith, submission, trust, humility, all of that has to come into play. And on our own, can we do that? What do we need to accomplish that? What do we have that helps us accomplish that? We have the Holy Spirit. Now, can you see just on this little bit how those of us who have the Holy Spirit should react to the world's problems versus those that don't have the Holy Spirit and how they do react with the problem? Do you see a difference? Should we see a difference? Yes. Yes, we should see a difference. But when we who should know the difference have doubt, a little unbelief, then we start acting like they do out here. And that causes a great bit of confusion in our lives. I talked about that this morning. Let's see what else it tells us. See, he is the God of Kahest. That's Hebrew for loyal love and truth. Now, what does it mean, loyal love? Pardon? It will never go away. Never. Look at 2 Samuel 2.6. Now, may the Lord show loving kindness and truth to you. And I also will show this goodness to you because you have done this thing. 2 Samuel 15.20. You came only yesterday. And shall I make you wander with us while I go where I will? Return and take back your brothers. Mercy and truth be with you. But 40 verse 11. You, O Lord, will not withhold your compassion from me. Your loving kindness and your truth will continually preserve me. Now that is a promise there of loyal truth. Have you ever been in a place when it doesn't seem like God is anywhere? That you're all alone? That no matter how much you study, reality is saying you're all alone. Your reality is telling you uh, there's no hope. Have you ever felt that way? Well, look at this promise. Look at this promise again. When you're all alone, you don't think anybody's there. And in your own mind, you have been forsaken. This is what he, this is what he says. Lord, will not, you will not withhold your compassion from me. Your loving kindness and your truth will continually preserve me. Even going through those situations, his compassion is with you. His love will preserve you. In order for us to go along with that, what do we need? What do we need to do? We need to understand that God is sovereign and he will do these things. But even within the midst of God's sovereignty, we have a responsibility. So if God says his compassion is there, and if he says his love will preserve us, what do we need? What do we need to do on our part? If he's doing, what do we need to do on our part? Accept it. To trust it and to believe the yea and the amen. Even, even when it doesn't seem it's there. That is when our faith, that is when we can be like the man whose, whose son was throwing himself in the fire and the disciples could not deliver his son. And he goes to Jesus and he said, your disciples could not deliver him, but Lord, if you can deliver my son. And Jesus said, if I can. If I will. And he says, Lord, I believe. But then this other word came, but Lord, help my unbelief. It's at those times when we're there that we realize we have a little bit of doubt. And that's when we cry out to the Lord, Lord, help my unbelief. And why do I say that? Because his word just says his compassion is there. That his love will preserve me. It is there for us. It is there for me. It is there for you. We just need to pray for faith in order to receive what is already there, to push beyond our finite mind and the limitations of what we expect because that's what we as man expects rather than opening our hearts to get and receive what God has said he would supernaturally give. D, all of God's words are faithful and true. Second Samuel seven twenty-eight. now, O Lord, 
You are, O Lord God, you are God and your words are truth and you have promised this good thing to your servant. 19.9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous together. Look at 25.10, all the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Now look at this. That is a promise of what we call a condition. God's in his sovereignty all, all paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth. That is God's sovereignty. What is the condition? What is our responsibility for that truth? Uh, Gary, I'm lost. Page, page 15, second one down. Oh, on page 15. Yep. Okay, all the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth. That's the God, of, the sovereign God. That's who he is. That's what he says. But there's a condition, a responsibility for us in order to receive that and to experience that what is that in that verse what keep his covenant and his testimonies so you can see what god is going to do what god is doing but we have a responsibility for that to do that let's go to page 16 E, God is abounding in truth. These are things that we covered last week. I'm just trying to hit the highlights so we can get to the night. E, God is abounding in truth. I like Exodus 34, 6 because this is the Lord. He put Moses in the cleft of the rock and he is announcing his own himself. He is showing Moses his hind parts. He's coming across and this is what he says about himself. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. That's how God described himself to Moses. Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Now, I like that slow to anger aspect. God is not quick in his wrath. He is slow to anger. That's why when we look at people who sin to do these heinous things and we say, well, why doesn't God punish them right away? God is slow to anger. Perhaps that man has a walk to get saved. Okay. Now, in our finite minds, we say, well, he took a life. He should be punished right now. We look at what the man has done in his behavior. We see it. It's terrible. But we need to remember when we think that way about someone who has committed murder, that the Bible says if you hate somebody, you've committed murder in your heart. And the question I ask is, when you do something, are you glad God is slow to anger, gracious and full of mercy? If that's the case, then why are we so quick to want judgment on somebody else that does something heinous? That's not our job. That's that, God's job. That's, well, that is God's job. Really take dog and then do it out of sheer anger when you don't know what God may be doing in this person. Sure, that's right. He has plans for that person's life. You don't have that right. Well, why do we why do we feel that way with injustice? Pardon? Well, well, that's only partial. Well, that's partial too, but why, why have that initial feeling only? Well, uh, that's part of the attribute of God that's impressed. Bingo. That is something God placed in us. We want justice. The trouble is we want justice according to self-righteousness and human action. We do not see justice in the perfect way that God does. God is patient and long-suffering. That means he takes his time. He lets things go. Sometimes he lets the sinner continue to do what he's doing in order that the believer would come to salvation and would grow, but yet he is still going to pay, pay in the price for his rejecting Christ. God uses the wicked, okay? But that's, God for, that's for God to use. He understands. We have justice. We have a desire for mercy, but sin has tainted that in us. 
We look at things and say, well, that's not right. I think it should be done now. That is that self-righteous judgment that you read in Matthew 7. Judge not lest you be judged. If you really want justice for somebody before the, because of what they've done and what they're doing, the question comes back, if that was you doing it, would you want God to take that justice out on you? Or would you want God to be patient and offer you an opportunity to repent? Yeah, we do. But see, that is what I talked about this morning. The biblical worldview versus the secular worldview. If we have a biblical worldview, we are going to just trust and have the mind in us that was in Christ. We are going to let we are going to open our hearts at the justice and mercy that God has placed in us, that through the Holy Spirit, he can teach us rather than us shutting the door. Now, the thing also, not only self-righteous, but if we are the ones that have to suffer the loss, if we are the ones that has to suffer the pain, that's when we want immediate justice and we want that person to pay dearly for what they've done for us, to us. Yet we forget the times that we've done those same things. You see, it's, it's to us now, we don't repay evil with evil. We repay evil with good. We trust that God will do justice. God says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We want justice in regards to what the law says. And we trust God with what the law does. Knowing that if the law does not do what they're supposed to, God will discipline the law. Those who uphold the law. But he wants us to submit to him and reflect him in his idea, not idea, with his reality of what justice is, of what love is, and what mercy is, and what grace is. So again, we have to renew our mind. Not be conformed to the world, be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And God's faithfulness, F, extends to the clouds. Your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the sky. So what is the length of God's faithfulness? Is there a limit to God's faithfulness? No, God is faithful. If there's anyone or anything unfaithful, it is us. God is always faithful. His word is yea and amen. Now, we may not see the immediate uh, things that we would like to see because of his faithfulness, because we are flesh and we want it now. Sometimes the answer that proves his faithfulness will take years. Or maybe we won't see it, but our children will. But God is faithful. I'll give you an example. In Genesis, God was going to destroy Nineveh. He said, I'm going to destroy Nineveh. He sent Jonah. Nineveh repented. That's why Jonah didn't want to go. My question to you is, did God still destroy Nineveh? Yes, he did. 300 years later, he did what he said he was going to do in Genesis. But he gave a reprieve in the middle for that group of people. He destroyed Nineveh. God did not break his word when he said, I will destroy them. He... Well, Jesus said, Jesus said, Nineveh will judge you. Jesus said, Sodom and Gomorrah will judge you. Because they paid the price for their judgment. Nineveh, they heard and they repented because Jonah told them. And Jesus says, and there is something here now even greater than Jonah, which was Christ. So God is faithful. God is faithful. Gee, God is a rock of refuge because of his dependable firmness. Deuteronomy 32, 4, the rock, his work is perfect for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. We read that statement. Have you ever looked up to heaven and said, God, that doesn't seem fair? They get away with everything and look at what happens to me. We're going opposite. This is what God, what God says about himself. 
And that you can see where our flesh rises up because we have no understanding of justice. And we have no understanding of faithfulness. And we forget that all his ways are just. There used to be a, a, a saying that the golden rule, you know, the golden rule, he who has the gold rules. Well, there's a God rule. He who is God rules. That means what he decrees, he does what he purposes, he accomplishes and his ways are not. He's not a tyrant. He is not evil. He is not wicked. He is righteous. He is holy. He is just. He is merciful. He is kind and he is gracious. What does that mean for us? It means all the promises he made, he would not leave us nor forsake us. That his death would bring us life. That we would reign with him in the millennial reign and that we would be with him in glory. He said what? In my father's house are many mansions. I go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come back for you. If this is true, then is that a promise? And if that is a promise, what do you have to look forward to? And what hinders us from that promise? What hinders us in us accepting that promise? Hmm? Lack of faith. And we are the... We are the... Not as much anymore, but we were the Burger King children. We wanted it fast, and we wanted it our way. And we wanted to do it in a way where it made us feel good. You remember? Hold the pickle, hold the lettuce, special orders, don't accept us. Here at Burger King, we want you to have it your way. That is not the kingdom of God. Yep. The kingdom of God says, I will save you. I will not leave you, forsake you. But you're going to have trials. You're going to have persecutions. You're going to have temptations. And many are going to hate you because they hate me. But hold on. Don't fear. I have overcome the world. So it's not a fast food mentality. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. Life is a marathon. And life for us began when Christ died on the cross, when we were, we were made, we were made, we made peace with God. We got access with God. God paid, Jesus paid for our price. And then we're anchored in his grace as he intercedes for us, perfecting in us to the point that one day we will see him in glory. That's our race. And in that race, there are going to be trials. There's going to be difficulties and circumstances and these truths about God we have to know because when we are in what we would call despair when we are depressed when we feel all alone without these scriptures we are alone with these scriptures according to his word we are encouraged with the fact that God cannot lie and he tells us if you do this that is the condition of responsibility in order for us to experience what God has given us. If we do this, then we will have a peace, a peace that passes all understanding. We do not have to fear. We do not have to fear rejection. We do not have to fear being alone because we are never alone and God Christ will never reject us. These are truths that can help us. But our flesh takes our finite minds and says, I'm too depressed. I can't read this stuff. Oh, this, this doesn't make sense. This can't be true because look at what I'm going through. It is true. He knows what you're going through. As a matter of fact, Hebrews tells us we have a high priest who is not unfamiliar with what we go through. That's why he came to experience that and to live it perfectly, righteous and sinlessly so that he could give us comfort through the power of the Holy Spirit. H, God keeps his covenants, page 18. Look at Deuteronomy 4.31. For the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not fail you, nor, looky, nor destroy you, nor forget his covenant, 
He made a covenant with us through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. We have eternal life through the blood of Christ. He will not destroy you. He will not separate you from him. You will be with him from now to all eternity in heaven if you are his child. He will not forsake you. He will not destroy you. He will not forget you. Nehemiah 1.5 at the bottom of 18. I said, I beseech you, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. What do you notice about what Nehemiah is saying in this verse? He said, I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. What are some of the things we could even see about Nehemiah as he does this prayer? What are some of the things that stand out to you about this verse? How does he address God? What does he say about God? He's great and awesome. But what else does he say? He's the Lord God of heaven. He's Adonai Yahweh of heaven. And what does God do in this verse? He preserves the covenant. And what else does he preserve? For who? And what? That's right, those who love him and obey. Can you see the relationship in here? Can you see what God is saying to us today? When we pray, we need to pray acknowledging who he is. He is the Lord God Almighty. The Old Testament is filled with his books. He is Jehovah Rapha, the healer. He is Jehovah Jireh, the provider. He is Jehovah Sid Canoe. He is Jehovah Makedodishkin. He is Quana, the jealous God. He is Jehovah Ra, the shepherd. Those names depict his character, but they also depict what he does in our life. He is El Roy, the God who sees. All of this tells us that God sees us. God is our savior. God is our sanctifier. God is our deliverer. God is our shepherd. God is our righteousness. His banner over us is love. Those all describe what God does to us. That's why the greatest name that we get in the Old Testament is Emmanuel. God with us. When you look at the names, you see his attributes as they are exhibited in our lives. And those are promises. He is the one who is your rock. He is the one who is your shield. He is the one who is your defender. Some may trust in horses. Some may trust in chariots. But we will trust what? In the name of our God. Yahweh, Adonai, Elohim. Know those names. Study the word to know who he is. Those are the encouragers in your life as you walk. Those are the attributes that Jesus himself shared in the New Testament. What did he say? I am the good shepherd. I am Jehovah Ra. Those are the things that we must study. Those are the things that we must just put in our hearts that as we go through times of difficulties, which we will, we know that we have a rock, a firm foundation that we will stand upon. And the battle is not ours. The battle is the Lord's. We are to be faithful and stand putting on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, holding the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and the belt of truth. We are to stand in that. And when we've done all else, Stand, because the battle is the Lord's. How do I know? Because he is my rock. He is my fortress. He is my deliverer. He is my light in the darkness. And he is greater than anything in this world. Satan is not God's equal. Satan is a fallen angel. 
There is no one equal to God. It is not a battle between light and darkness. Light has overcome. The battle for us is between sin and righteousness. And God has made a way for us to be righteous. These are the truths that I want you to put in your heart. These are the truths that I want this church to be built on, on the foundation. So as we go through times, we, even within our family, we know in whom we believe and we know who's in charge and we will just come together to pray, to trust in the one who has established us. Page 19. God is faithful to give full salvation. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1 9. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ our Lord. How did you become in fellowship with Jesus Christ? What does that tell us? Right, but it says you have. Uh, how did you get to have fellowship with Christ? Uh, it was through the cross. It, it was only through what Christ did. Sure. That, that we can be right. made right so that we can fellowship. But what does that scripture tell us? That one piece of scripture. Right. And what did he do? You were called into fellowship. God called you. You didn't join the fellowship. He called and you answered and said yes. God called you into fellowship. It's important for us to see these little nuances for the main reason that we realize if God called me into fellowship, there was no other way I could have fellowship. Therefore, all my works, everything I did in the world were not. There's nothing I could have done to earn salvation. There's nothing I could have done to gain fellowship with God. It had to be God who did the work through Jesus Christ and then called us into fellowship. That's full salvation. And look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. That specific passage needs to be explained. God does not tempt you. God tests. So if you're tempted, who is tempting you? The devil. And how is he tempting you? What is he using to tempt you? Your flesh. Your mind. So the Satan comes in your mind and says, you really want to do this, you've done it in the past. If you don't nip it in the bud there, as Barney Five says, it will drop it down into your heart and you will carry it out. But look what God says. No temptation is overtaking you, but such is common to man. That is an important statement because that means there's no demonic influence to tempt you. What it means is he's going to tempt you according to your own flesh your own passions, your own desires. It's not a supernatural temptation. How do I know it? Because it's, it's something common to man. It's something that we all have. And what do we all have apart from Christ? We have a carnal, fleshly nature. So he realms and he tempts us within that. Within that. And he says, he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you'll be able to endure it. Now, what that is saying is if that's true, and we believe it is, that God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can endure. If you fall to that temptation, whose responsibility is it? Ours. Because he says he will not allow you to be tempted what you can endure. So if you do it, then you're pushing away one in order to satisfy your flesh. Now, I remember being in a service one time and when I was a in the Assemblies of God, and I remember hearing two ladies talk and said, the devil really came after me this morning. About 8.05, all this stuff happened. And lady next to her said, you, you too? 
That was the same thing that happened to me. And I had to look at her and I say, you know, there's a lot of wrong with what you just said. One of you or both of you are not being honest because the devil is not omnipresent. He can't be more than one place at one time. And the second thing is, do you really think you are like the Apostle Paul? That God would allow Satan to come tempt you? Rather, why don't you look at what your day was and ask yourself what your heart was, what your behavior was. Flip Wilson used to have a show and he used to say that very same thing, the devil made me do that. But what did we just see in this? God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can endure and he will give you an out. I used to tell my children, nobody can make you do anything. You have to yield. And they said, well, what if somebody's robbing you and giving you money and, and you say no and they shoot you? Well, I said, that's a choice. You either give them what they want or you die. As a Christian, we either stand firm in our faith or we compromise. They can't make you do anything. I'm reminded in the voice of the martyrs, the gentleman that I, I, I may have this wrong, I'll have to check it. But the man who wrote, I decided to follow Jesus. He was in an African country and the rebels had come in the village. And um, they took his little four-year-old girl and put her on a spit and were cooking her. And they told the man, they told the man, if you recant and deny Christ, we will cut your daughter loose. And that little girl from the spit says, Daddy, don't. In a few minutes, I'll be with Jesus. And when you die, you'll be with me. And the man did not do that. You see, that is the ultimate test. Is there a line? I pray that I don't have that line. I can't answer you honestly now. I've never been put there. I hope I would do the right thing. But nobody can make you do anything. You choose to take the action that you choose. Is your love for God greater than anything in this world? Because if you love something more than you love God, you will compromise. Because you will save that which you love the most. And I'm not trying to be heartless here too. Believe me, I have 20 grandchildren. But that is what could happen to us. Jesus said, if you love your wife and your children more than me, you're not fit for the kingdom. He's not saying you need to hate them. But what he's saying is your love for him should be so great that love for others pales in comparison for the love you have of God through Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians 5.24, still on page 19. Faithful is he who, uh-oh, here's that word again, calls you. Now look at this. When God calls you in His grace, you will always say yes. How do I know? Faithful is He who calls you, and He also will bring it to pass. You will choose to go with God. Because he's going to set it that you choose to go with God. Because his draw, his call for you is irresistible. Nobody can resist God. If you say God can be resisted, then God isn't sovereign. God isn't God. So when he calls you, we run to his arms and said, here I am. And it looks like on our own volition, we accepted it. He made it come to pass. He put a love in our heart for truth. He put a love in our heart for salvation, that we willingly embraced it. But it is all an action from God. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. How faithful? Look at Hebrews 11, 11, the top of page 22. By faith, even Sarah herself, listen, received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who had promised. 
Without God's intervention, Sarah could never have had Isaac. She was too old. No way. But she said, God is faithful. If God says I'm going to have a son, I'm going to have a son. And I can imagine at the age of 98, that was probably a shock to her. And then, of course, my favorite, one of my favorites, 1 John 1, 9. All of God's promises in Christ are responded to by yes and amen. Now, let's stop. All God's promises in who? In Christ. So for a dying world without Christ, do they get any of God's promises? No. It has to be in Christ. Now, God gives everybody grace. He calls what we call that. He gives them common grace. The, the sinners are allowed to wake up. They're allowed to have jobs. They're allowed to have families. That's common grace. Each one of us has received not just common grace, but we received saving grace. Christ has been revealed to us. Not only has he been revealed to us, God has called us and fulfilled that calling through Christ in us. The world, apart from Christ, do not get any of those promises. No guarantees. We do. And then 1 John 1, 9. Oh, we read that. That's uh, in Christ are responded by yes and amen. 2 Corinthians 1, 18 and 20. But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me, and Sylvanius and Timothy, was not yes and no, but is yes in him, him being Christ. For as many as are the promises of God in him, Christ, they are yes. Therefore, also through him, Christ, is our amen to the glory of God through us. All of our promises, all of this which God says is ours, only because it's through Christ, his righteousness, and his blood. Number three, God is truly metaphysically. He is what God should be. He is not like the false gods, which are vanities and lies. And we've talked about that. Images and idols. <laughs> On the 23, number four, God is true ethically. His re revelation about himself is perfectly reliable. And again, Exodus 34, describing himself, he says, Then the Lord passed by in front of him, that's Moses, and proclaimed the Lord. The Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Deuteronomy 32.4 on the page of 24, the top. The rock, his work is perfect for all his ways are just. Of God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Jeremiah 10.10 10. A little halfway down on that page. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and everlasting King. At His wrath, the earth quakes. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. John 17, 3. This is eternal life, that they may know you the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Titus 1, 2, top of page 25. In the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised long ago. Hebrews six eighteen, So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. What were those two unchangeable things? It is impossible for God to lie. And we take strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. That hope. Again, in the past, God made, Jesus made peace with God through us, giving us access to God through the blood of his sacrifice. He rooted us. We are rooted in our forgiveness in the past. We are rooted in our forgiveness today in the grace and mercy of God 
that Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. That is where we are today. Now we hold on to the hope. We know God does not lie. We hold on that, but now we hold on to the encouraging hope that one day when the sin is removed from our heart in its finality, we will be glorified and we will see Him as He is. And we will reign with Him. We will live with Him and we will worship Him in a place where there's no more tears, no more sorrow, no more crying, when there is no sun because God, Jesus Himself, will be the light. That is our hope. That is what we hold on now. Those are the two encouragements, the two things that we hold on to. The unchangeableness of our salvation, that God cannot lie, and that we have that hope. And that is what we should hold on to. And finally, for today, 1 John 5, 20 and 21. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. Little children, guard yourself from idols. Now let's look at this real quick. Let's just look at that verse. We know that the Son of God has come in Jesus has come. But what has He given us? He's given us understanding. And how do we get understanding? Studying His Word, but what helps us with the understanding? The Holy Spirit. And I'm looking for something real quick here, and I will close with it. Let me cheat a little bit. Look at my Logos. Let me see if that's right. Turn with me to Luke chapter 24. 24. Remember it says to us, He has given us Understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true. I'm going to read this. It's a little long passage, but you will see what I am going. After Jesus arose, it was hard for people to believe that he, was, he had risen from the grave. This route I'm going to read to you covers the two on the road to Emmaus. So I want you to listen as I read Luke 24, and I'm going to start with 13. And behold, two of them were going to the very, that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you were walking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of them, named Cleophas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all of this, it's the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning. And did not find his body, they came saying that they also had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. 
Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as exactly as the woman also had said. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. And I'm going to stop right there for a minute. These are people who were expecting the resurrection of Christ, who were expecting Christ to redeem Israel. They had no idea of what was really they were believing in. They had no understanding. Christ had to come and he, he just said, he opened the scriptures to them. You say, well, how does that affect me? There are a lot of people in church who are happy with milk. They never search scriptures. Their faith is never deepened nor increased. They have a superficial faith that when things happen, they're easily tossed to and fro because the anchor has not been planted. When God saved you through Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came and Jesus said he came to teach you all things. But if you go to school, any school, and you don't open the books for your subjects, you cannot learn what that subject is. The Word of God is our book. It is more than a book. It is a living document. It is the living testimony of the history of God, the redemption of man. It's not about us. It's about Him. But in it, it tells what He does for us and what He expects of us. But if you don't read the word, if you don't take the time to use the understanding of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you something. It takes time. It takes time when you study to be able to sort, to get out. But each time you read, each time you study, your faith is increased because the word of God is put in your heart. But you cannot know about Jesus apart from Jesus. Jesus told the Pharisees, you study the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But they speak of me and you reject me. That tells us that apart from understanding who Jesus is, the scriptures aren't going to make any sense to you. Because once you know who Jesus is, the Holy Spirit indwells in you and begins to teach you regarding all things Jesus said, all things he taught. There's a correlation there. Without Jesus, this is just a book and you could read the Odyssey. You could read any book and you say, well, that's a good story. A little kid killed a giant. Look at that. Wow, what a good story. But once you become a believer in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit gives you understanding, you understand why David did what he did. It was because he was blaspheming God and David was standing up for the honor of God. So there's a reason even now that I'm giving you these scriptures. I want you to study them. I want you to look at them because. Verse 27 then beginning with Moses, that's the first five books of the law. Deut De um, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Numbers. And with all the prophets, Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Malachi, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Haggai, Hosea. He explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. What's he saying? He's saying, I am in those scriptures. When you search the Old Testament, you will see types of Christ. Whether it's the fourth man in the fire, whether it's the ark. You will see whether it's the ram that Abraham sacrificed rather than his son. You will find Christ and you will see and you will understand in the New Testament as Jesus walks how he is what they described in the Old Testament. And I say that because we need to remember that there was no New Testament then. They were being taught the law, the prophets, and the poems.
put a mark there on number five so we can remember to pick that up next time. You know, I talked to Cindy today. Hopefully the snow's letting up. She'll be able to get on that plane at seven in the morning. You know, and I told her, I said, I love this church. She was with us this morning. She watched it on Facebook. I cannot believe God blessed me to be here with you folks. And not only am I blessed, but I take that very seriously with the responsibility of bringing you the Word of God. And my heart's desire is that you would develop a love for the Word of God. And that by developing the love for the Word of God, you would come to know the God that, you know, that saved you with a deeper love, with gratitude. That you would understand Jesus, the second person in the Trinity, as being the actor what I mean actor, he didn't act, but he was the one that did the action for the crucifixion. And the third person of the Trinity, that intimate one that dwells within us, how he teaches and reminds us and draws us and lets us experience the love, but more importantly, he adopted us into the family of God. I want you to know and love that God. I want you to become so familiar with the scripture just like one who deals with counterfeit, they never touch counterfeit. They only touch the good money. That way when they get the bad money, they know the difference. And I want you to know the good money. I don't want the enemy to try to sneak in and try to steal any of our sheep. I want you to know the good shepherd, that the Holy Spirit would strengthen you. The Holy Spirit would keep you and that you would reflect his love. That, that is my desire for the time I have with you. To give you the word. To teach you the word. And hopefully you can catch my passion for the word. And my love for the Lord. You folks mean the world to me. And I protect you just like I protect my own immediate family. Because that's what God has called me to do. So I'm going to pray because I've kept you about 15 minutes longer than I'd like to. I'd like for you to be able to get home and have an evening. But I want you to go home and as you look at this, where I didn't fill in those scriptures, I want you to look at the scriptures. I want you to become familiar with the scriptures. Those scriptures are your lifeline. Amen. Father, we thank you for our time tonight. We thank you for your truth and your love and your promises. I pray for all that are here, that you would bless their homes, that you would birth in their hearts such a love for you, that you would show them the areas of unbelief that need to be repented for and strengthened, that you would change us, Father, that we would reflect your Son. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now we will have prayer. Falling and wonder where